All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us and welcome to our, well, I'm gonna to hesitate to say this, but I'll just say it, our first brown bag discussion of the fall. You'll, you'll know why in a minute. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is, is Marc-Andre Pigeon, Marc-Andre Pigeon. I am the director of the Canadian Center for the Study of Cooperatives at the uh, Johnson Choyama Graduate School of Public Policy in the University of Saskatchewan. The title of today's talk is Called to Act, Implementing Reconciliation in Cooperatives. Now, before we begin this timely conversation, I want to acknowledge that we're coming to you today from Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Now, Treaty 6 encompasses the tra traditional territories of many First Nations, but in including most notably the James Smith Cree Nation and the village of Weldon. Today, we and everyone at the University of Saskatchewan offer our deepest condolences to all those affected by, that, by this tragedy and in this time of grieving. We honor and acknowledge those communities, their dead and those who mourn them, the wounded and all their friends, families and colleagues. We also offer our support in whatever way we can uh, in their pain and grief and long road to healing. Across, across this place we now call Saskatchewan, we affirm and reaffirm our commitment to the hard shared necessary work of reconciliation. Uh, it's important, I think, as we're here together, all of us, that we support one another in the community in, this, in a moment of silence for James Cree Nation, James Smith Cree Nation and Weldon, and all our relations. So we'll begin the moment of silence now, please. Thank you, everyone. As our featured speaker, Tanya Tourangeau contends, reconciliation can't be achieved without being partners, allies, and friends who unite and form a connection, protect and safeguard each other, and champion and promote one another's causes and interests. We meet, share, and learn from each other here today as partners, allies, and friends who live in our treaties, fully engaged in the calls to action, truth, and reconciliation. Now, Tanya is a proud Dene from the Northwest Territories, also living and working on Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta. Her consulting firm, Tanya T. Consulting, helps organizations, including cooperatives, in their journey to implement reconciliation through strategy, policy, and stakeholder relations. She also specializes in community economic and Indigenous youth workforce development, and a lot of that work involves building partnerships and building capacity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous governments and organizations, all with an eye to building this nation better together. Tanya, we are grateful and honored that you are with us today. Um, just a little word about how Tanya came to us um, through a conversation with Shauna Peddle at the Cooperators, who I understand she's been working with, um, and we're grateful for Cooperators to making this connection. Now, before we hear from Tanya, a short word on our, our Lunch and Learn series. Uh, while each session features one speaker, the series is about really engaging, collaborating, learning, and challenging ourselves and the cooperative sector in a respectful and patient way. Um, there's, there, are, there are a way to remind ourselves about our shared responsibility to each other, our communities, and generations past and future, as well as the land, water, and skies that, that make all of this possible. Over the next 15, 20, maybe a little more minutes, Tanya is going to share with us an overview of her work, her experience and guidance on how the co-op sector can better answer the calls to action and engage in respectful, impactful, informed reconciliation. And then Tanya and I, uh, hopefully we have a little bit of time for a short conversation, and then we're gonna break out. We're gonna have group discussions. So this is where the action really is. This is where people really get to kind of play with the ideas and engage. Um, and we'll do that for about 10, 15 minutes. Then we're gonna come back, regroup, share, and wrap up. Um, just one last, 
thing before I ask Tanya to take uh, the floor, the microphone. Um, if anyone is experiencing te technical difficulties, you can message Stan You Stan, can you just wave to folks so they know you're there and where you are? Um, you can text Stan to the chat function and he'll help you uh, in whatever way he can. Lastly, we're gonna be recording this session and the link to that recording and some resources that Tanya has made available to us will be shared with you after the event. So thank you everyone. Tanya, the floor is yours. Mm. Merci, Chair Mark Andre, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I'm really honored and humbled to be invited to uh, this um, lunch and learn session, and excited to uh, share what I have to share and also hear and collaborate with you. Before I start my land acknowledgement, I'm also going to put in the chat uh, my welcome and encourage you to share where you're joining from in and across Turtle Island and your name, please. Um, I'm going to start my presentation and get right into it so that we have the maximum amount of time uh, today together. As mentioned, um, I'm currently in Treaty 6 land as well. I'm in a Miskwachi Waskegan. Uh, again, a Miskwachi Waskegan stands for uh, Cree for Beaver Hills House. It is Edmonton. It's on the traditional lands, uh, meeting grounds, gathering places and traveling routes of the Cree, the Soto, the Blackfoot, the Dene, the Nakota Sioux and the Métis, whose histories and language and cultures continue to enrich our shared heritage. Um, just a note I'm going to make at the top, you see 1899, that's uh, when Treaty 8 was signed that I'm going to refer to later on in my presentation. For those of you who are familiar with the um, TRC's 94 calls to action, land acknowledgement is an unofficial um, call to action. You won't find it written anywhere, but it is an unofficial call to action because it is a traditional way that our people, our Indigenous people, start our, our meetings, our events, our gatherings, and it's because uh, we've been a part of this land since time immemorial, and it's, it's the honorable way to acknowledge the people who have cared for this land since time immemorial. And when we say time immemorial, we really believe that. We believe that science hasn't caught up to us yet, that um, just recently there was archaeological finds that was updated about 30,000 years ago, um, of an animal that was found that was killed by, by an arrow made by indigenous people from here. And it dated beyond what science had originally thought. And during COVID, there was um, an arrowhead found in BC that was 11,000 years old. And it was from a different part of Canada. So it, it, it strengthened the understanding amongst us indigenous people that we've been trading and thriving and surviving here since time immemorial uh, in this land uh, across Turtle Island. We didn't come across in the Bering Strait. Uh, one of um, the elders from Treaty 6 has shared, he's like, science thinks we came across the Bering Strait on a skidoo and we don't believe that. And to give you an example of other ancient civilizations that are honored um, globally, Cleopatra was 3,500 years ago. The pyramids were four to 500 years, four to 5,000 years ago. We've been a part of this land since time immemorial. So when we start the land acknowledgement, it's really important to us and means a lot to us when we hear people acknowledging the original peoples of this land. So I thank you for allowing me to take the time to do that today. And welcome everyone from across the many treaties I see in the chat box. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. And even the Indigenous people, the non-Indigenous people who are interested, Masi Cho, that's uh, thank you in my Dene language. Nasika Soon, Kihu Miguan Esqueo. I've just been recently been gifted my spirit name and I shared it with you in Cree. Uh, although I identify with Dene, there's some star-crossed lovers uh, in my Mushum and Kukum. My Kukum was Cree and uh, my Mushum was Dene and he stole her down in Cree country and brought her back up to Dene. So 
Cree is a part of my Dene heritage, and um, I was gifted my spirit name um, by a Cree elder in Treaty 6 area here just last week. Um, I said my name is Tanya Taranjo. Uh, my spirit name is, um, this is my first time sharing it publicly. So. My spirit name is Eagle Feather Woman. And there's a story behind that. If you um, follow me on social media, I recently fed an eagle and um, save that for maybe another talk of Lunch and Learn. Um, Dene uh, First Nation from the Northwest Territories. Uh, I come from a family of residential school survivors. I consider myself a cycle breaker, uh, but most importantly, a bridge builder. I say a cycle breaker because um, I became pregnant when I was 14 years old, I became a mom when I was 15. And since that day when I had my son, I knew I wanted to make a difference. I knew I wanted to break cycles in my family and build a better tomorrow for my children. And with that, I became a bridge builder, um, which brought me here today, building bridges between um, the non-Indigenous and Indigenous people seeking reconciliation across Canada. My treaty was signed in 1899, which I shared in the land acknowledgement. And the reason why I share that is because it's so important that imagine we were celebrating 123 years of strength instead of 123 years of assimilation, colonization, racism, and so on. That had those treaties been signed from an honorable place, from a place of friendship, from a place of understanding what you've gathered here today, imagine how better off we could have been as a country. That if we were true partners signing those treaties, and my hope today is going forward is that we can't fix the past and I'm not, I don't walk this path to shame anyone, but that we can realize our mistakes from the past and together build a better tomorrow for everyone in Canada. Um, residential schools um, were created before Canada was created. The last one was closed in 1996. We weren't allowed to practice our our culture up until 1960, that if you visit museums uh, across the globe that you'll find artifacts of ours that um, were basically stolen and, and taken away from us in, in all in hopes to uh, kill the Indian in us so that we didn't honor or we didn't um, hold up our oppressors to be accountable to the treaties that instead of working with us, that they just basically wanted to take all the wealth from this land and assimilate us to be uh, non-Indians. The residential school survivors sued the government in 1996. The Truth and Reconciliation was created in 2008, and it was built upon the same uh, framework that originated from South Africa with dealing with apartheid. I think that's really important because people don't understand really the true tragedies that have gone on in the Canadian government. And there's a reason they don't understand is because we were erased from history. We always knew as Indigenous people what our ancestors went through, what our mushrooms, cookums, aunties, uncles, cousins went through, but it was sheltered from non-Indigenous people. You generally did not know what happened. During the commission, there was over 7,000 uh, stories recorded of survivors. And from, um, from those stories, from the gatherings, uh, 94 calls to action came to be in 2015. Um, as well, there was an inquiry of missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls, which resulted uh, during COVID in 231 calls to justice. Uh, you can't I uh, failed to include in this slide the 60 scoop survivors who are also very much a part of this tragedy um, that happened to us across Canada. And what, what that's resulted today for particularly uh, our Indigenous youth is that we're suffering, that to a point um, assimilation and colonization worked, that because of breaking down our families 
over generations over generations that we're dealing with federal prisons in, in Edmonton and Canada with 50 plus populations being indigenous. That there was a study in Calgary in 2019 that, and this was before COVID, that 60% of Indigenous students weren't graduating. That our young females and, and male youth are committed suicide five to seven times um, more often than non-Indigenous youth. That in fact, in Indian country, that a lot of times that we're attending uh, funerals and we're attending graduations. Across, across the country, we're either underemployed, unemployed, or uneducated in dealing with social, social services system, justice system, addictions, you name it. However, if we were equal, going back to that 123 years of celebrating strengths, if we were equal as a non-Indigenous people in Canada, we could increase the GDP today by $100 billion. So if we lifted our people out of jail, if we lifted them through high school, post-secondary, if they were equal in holding jobs, being business owners, being landowners, we could all be richer together in Canada. And that's why I do what I do and be that bridge builder to assist our people in getting out of um, really the, the assimilation holders created by the Canadian government. Now, within the reconciliation um, strategies I've been a part of, really, they're very much from a cooperative approach that we believe as Indigenous people that enough is enough of creating programs, strategies uh, without us. The, the term that you may hear often is nothing for us without us now. We want to be at the table. And not only do we want to be at the table, we want our IKS systems, our Indigenous frameworks, to be active in the solutions that are going to be for us. And those solutions need to be win-win. We want to have both partners. That The tide that rises is going to raise all boats. And when I mention Indigenous frameworks, I'm referring to our natural laws, our sacred teachings. Now, they're very um, similar, but they're also di different across Canada. You know, some have TP teachings, some have grandfather teachings. Um, but at, at the base, it's about the understanding of natural law and, and how we treat each other in a good way. Within that is also including ceremony uh, within the reconciliation frameworks. Uh, a lot of times we're asked as Indigenous people to leave who we are as Indigenous people at the door when we go to work. And I'm very much about bringing ceremony with us in everything that we do, in our strategic planning, in our reconciliation, in our work culture. And the other two frameworks is TRC's call to action number 92, which is business reconciliation and UNDRIP. Uh, UNDRIP stands for United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. <clears throat> now briefly covering number 92, a lot of people who are not familiar with the 94 calls to action think that they have to answer all 94 calls. When you hear on news and media saying, um, we've only answered so many calls, we're not nowhere near where we should be. It's true, we're not nowhere where we should be. However, the 94 calls to action are divided up into who's responsible for what. For example, one of the calls to action was to have the Pope apologize. The call that directly deals with business reconciliation is number 92. And it's not fair to say it's just one call because it is one large encompassing call. One, it deals with saying UNDRIP should be adopted. Then it goes into specific building relationships with local indigenous communities, uh, providing jobs, training and education opportunities, uh, providing sustainable benefits from economic development projects and providing education for management and staff, basic employment. Uh, training orientation and ongoing information 
kind of like what you're doing right now with the lunch and learn. So although again, it's one call, there's a lot within that call that can be built within your reconciliation strategy, your reconciliation journey. I don't think that anyone in um, indigenous country is expecting one corporation, one organization to start right away answering everything within number 92. And the place to start specifically where I'm starting with the cooperators is building out a strategy that's going to prioritize where they're aligned right now with their core values. So if we're going to look at jobs and training, identifying what is the current workforce of Indigenous people that identify and where do you want to get to? Like the population of Canada is on average between five to seven percent. Is the goal going to be in the cooperators, you know, within the next five to ten years or maybe longer to equal that? And what about in regions where there's higher indigenous population, where there's 20, 30, 40% uh, indigenous population, how are we going to bring equality to those regions as well? So as you see, there's many ways that you can look at call number 92 and align it to where you're at in your reconciliation journey, what opportunities you have in your organization and what's your capacity now, for those of the uh, don't understand what UNDRIP is, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it's exactly that. It's, it's declaring that as Indigenous people, we have basic rights. And why this is so important is because so many laws, uh, really colonization is based on that uh, historically going back to the doctrine of discovery. And if you were paying attention to the Popo visit, the Popo built bulls that basically declared indigenous people savages and that we had no rights to hold land. So by declaring that we do have rights as people, it's, it's starting that reconciliation journey of equality because we haven't had that and still don't have that 100% from the Canadian government from Canada, in Canada today. Uh, along with um, having the Indigenous frameworks within developing reconciliation um, strategies, it's also what I, I frame the four C's, ensuring that there's culture and ceremony, ensuring that that culture is local, understanding that our culture is not pan-Indigenous across Canada, that there's connection, that there's relationships build within your strategy, that there's time for that. Um, there's open to collaboration, you know, just like what you're doing today with, you know, gathering um, some knowledge, um, having some questions and some discussion on it and, and encouraging feedback. You know, what, the question that's going to be put forth to you, I'm really interested in where you see yourself on your reconciliation journey and where you see there's potential for opportunity for win-win with Indigenous peoples and ongoing communication. You know, a lot of times that strategies like this, that they're built in silo with consultants. And um, my approach is the openness, this consensus, this Indigenous way of um, building and, and creating together. Uh, with that, I've also uh, kind of adapted the pro size uh, ad car model, model to incorporate the four C's within uh, the change management plans that we're doing with the cooperators. But we're also um, bringing this right in from the beginning when we're starting our um, strategy development to ensure that everyone embraces this reconciliation uh, strategy. This is going to be a huge um, system shift, a culture shift within the cooperators, really dealing with uh, histories. You know, we're dealing, we're dealing with histories of trauma. Uh, Non-Indigenous people are dealing with generations of misinformation that needs to be unlearned. And, so it's really important that when you're doing your reconciliation strategy, strategy whether it's as large as what we're um, trying to accomplish at the cooperators or in a smaller scale, that you incorporate change management right from the beginning. 
this is a high level overview of the kind of time frame I have uh, set forward with the idea uh, strategy team at the cooperators. And you see through all the phases that I'm incorporating indigenous education, uh, IKS change management, and collaboration in my strategy development, that those are three keys, three key pillars before I even get to sit down uh, next year and put together um, the strategy, uh, the reconciliation strategy, with everyone's input right from the beginning. Uh, typically, what's going to happen at the cooperators starting next month is that each and every employee is going to have the opportunity to take part in a knowledge sharing, sharing session, uh, much like this, but longer and in depth, about 90 minutes. Uh, they'll have the ability to take in a cultural learning session with an elder, a knowledge keeper, or an Indigenous community member, and to participate in a sharing circle. And what we're encouraging is that there'll be sharing circles that will be not only uh, cross departments that are going to be impacted by the reconciliation strategy, but also within their own departments, you know, really creating that uh, relationship and embracing what they're eventually going to be implementing in the future. Uh, with the phases, uh, this is actually uh, the eagle that I fed and gifted me my, my eagle feather that became my name last week. This is like a new special friend. I'm going to have to give him a name. Uh, but the phase one outcomes is that we're going to uh, really be looking at those guiding frameworks and coming up with reconciliation commitment statement with guiding principles uh, for a strategy that will cover uh, three to five years. And with that, I'm going to put together an Indigenous engagement outreach plan, uh, really identifying the local Indigenous communities, stakeholders that the cooperators can already have, or where there's gaps. Uh, where relationships need to be built. Because again, uh, nothing for us without us. Uh, phase two outcomes that we're going to take uh, and identify and prioritize the, prioritize the elements or the pillars of call number 92 that's important uh, to the cooperators and starting that, uh, starting that to build upon uh, what we're going to work in developing the initiative work plans that will support those prioritized pillars. So um, very ambitious have what the cooperators have been committed to. They have a strong team, a uh, project team, a governance team that's going to be guiding us. In addition to that, they've also committed to uh, building a uh, Indigenous youth uh, employment program that is currently under research and hopefully we'll have a report uh, ready by the end of the month. Um, my um, my approach uh, comes with a lot of benefits and, and is unique in uh, the non-Indigenous world, but not to the Indigenous world. I think that by incorporating worldviews and our uh, Indigenous frameworks of culture and ceremony and everything that we do, that it really builds a sense of purpose and uh, an increased work culture with everyone, um, increases motivation and engagement, and it, it builds a strategy that is even better than someone could have done in silo, you know, in a room with, um, with the top executives. That when you build it together, everyone's going to celebrate it, welcome it, and it, it's only going to lead to stronger, um, better reconciliation strategies in the years to come. Because, you know, it's taken... It's taken over a hundred years to get to where we are to these um, terrible conditions and it's going to take generations to get out and to become equal and to thrive um, together in Canada. And I try to keep it to 15 minutes, but uh, I did my best and hopefully uh, we still have some time from some great discussion. That was great. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I'm gonna just ask you one question, then we'll jump into the breakout. Just, I wanna make sure we have time for people to have a chat and get you some feedback too. Um, so uh, Tanya, before we started today's conversation, uh, you brought something to our attention around uh, the way we label this <laughs> event. Um, and it struck me that while we were talking about that, this is a kind of opportunity to kind of 
exemplify some of the things you're talking about. So can you just, I, I'd rather you tell the story than, than me. Uh, what's, 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 what, what, did you, what did you observe? What did you share with us? Thank you. That's a, a great segue into it. And um, so Indigenous people are very um, humorous. We love to make fun of everything and find opportunity to make fun and joke and it's so important to us because it's gotten us through a lot of hard times and yeah some of us would be like oh that's that's I'm not sure if I want to go there and that's not really funny but and what I'm sharing about to share with you I found very funny and and but also eye-opening that language is important so um I have a I have a large Indigenous following on my social media and it wasn't jump didn't jump out to me right away but one feedback was was well who's the brown bag in the session and is it the brown bag given a brown bag session or what? And, you know, indigenous people went so far with that. So what, and then when I joined the call, it's like, I can't remember the right now, I think it's CSSC brown bag slash Tanya Taranjo. And I was like, so I told everyone, I hope I'm the last brown bag to give a brown bag session. And going forward, this will now be a lunch and learn. And um, yeah, that was just the, little native humor and you know to lighten the light lighten the conversation and a great way to uh get into uh, important discussion thanks yeah so no uh, exactly and, and you mentioned you know looking for opportunities in your organizations for acts of reconciliation and this is not a very big one but it's something anyway and it was kind of unexpected so um we're grateful for that um so uh tanya you had posed we'd asked you to come up with a couple of questions that we could ask the group. Um, I'm going to get to those in a minute, but before we do that, just a bit of a preamble. Uh, this is the part of our, our lunchtime conversations where we hear from you. Uh, these are, again, this kind of conversation is meant to be an opportunity for people to socialize, get to know each other, but also wrestle with these issues that are really important to the cooperative community and the broader community. So we're going to break you out into groups of four, maybe three, um, and we're going to ask you, if you don't know everyone in your group, do some introductions, who you are, where you're from, where you work, where you study, uh, what you study, that kind of thing, what brought you here today. Um, and then after you've gotten through those kind of um, introductory kind of notes, um, then we're going to ask you to think about and talk about the questions that Tanya is posing for us. Um, and we'll put those in the chat, but I'll read them aloud um, just right now. So the first question is, where are you on your reconciliation journey? And then I, the, the second question is, how can your organization start to implement uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Call to Action number 92? And we're going to put that in the chat as well. So if you, don't, if you haven't memorized it, uh, it'll be there for you to consult. So those are the two questions. Where are you on your journey? And how can your organization start to do something about um, call number 92? Um, and begin with some introductory comments if you don't already know each other. So Stan, we're gonna break for about 12 minutes. Stan, if you can set us up and uh, we'll see you back then. And we'll have a little bit of a plenary conversation then we'll wrap up. So see you soon. All right, well, welcome back everyone. I hope you had a, a productive conversation. Uh, we did, ran the clock, of course, um, there's always never enough time. Uh, so this is the part where we uh, we kind of open it up. Uh, so I would just offer the floor to somebody who has a question for Tanya or wants to share a little bit about the conversation in their breakout group, and uh, then we'll get Tanya to engage, if that's okay, Tanya, just a bit of back and forth. Okay, so uh, who would like to jump in and maybe share or have a question for Tanya? Delphine, I hope I said your name properly. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just um, was interested in hearing about the cultural component, Tanya, and in some of the activities that you mentioned. Um, how do you balance the respect um, to that to that um, cultural ceremony or to the ceremonial aspect from an Indigenous perspective to bringing non-Indigenous people into that circle? Great question, Delphine. Um, to give you an example, uh, one of my clients is uh, Alberta Mentors. And if you're interested in um, mentoring Indigenous youth, please check out albertamentors.ca. I'll just give you that plug. But for example, uh, we want to 
bring powwows um, into, um, I guess, the perspective that they, anyone can go to a powwow. And so what we put together is a powwow 101 that uh, outlines protocols <laughs> and um, basics understanding and, you know, giving information about, you know, listening to the MC, you know, how to show up at a powwow. If, there, if there's a poster with a powwow out there to know that you can go to it. It's just probably finding the right um, gravel road to get down and ensure you show up. Um, with a good heart. And so that's one way of learn, learning that ceremony, that culture protocol. And powwows aren't everywhere. Like I'm from the Northwest Territories, there's not powwows. So what we have is tea dances, you know, our hand games, finding out what's local to, to your Indigenous local population, and asking those questions, you know, and um, if you're asking an elder, I encourage that uh, you carry tobacco and ask properly with offering tobacco. You know, it's easy to research something like that and, and finding out that it's okay to ask questions and be open to the answers that you're going to be given. And to know that just like, you know, you wouldn't go into a Catholic church, you know, without knowing um, basics. Otherwise you sit there and just be quiet the same way of attending um, Indigenous ceremony and culture. Thank you, Delphine. Thanks. Thank you, Delphine, and thank you, Tanya. Uh, we'll open it up again. Anyone else want to jump in? Uh, I think I saw, Aaron, I saw a fleeting hand. Is that a uh, genuine oh, hand? I'm always or? like, it's like, <laughs> ask an Indigenous person anything time. Or, or share, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, or think, share. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Mark Andre, I see that uh, oh, Tian yeah. has his hand up. Go ahead, Sam. Hi, Tanya. Thank you so much for uh, your interesting and educational presentation. Uh, so my name is Tian. I'm from CDF Canada. We are an uh, NGO developing co-ops in developing countries. So I think uh, uh, the topic here today is really, really important for us because when we do uh, co-op development in other countries, we want to make sure that we understand their culture uh, their their background, their needs, and so on. Uh, so my in, my question will be related to uh, two C's of your four C principle: uh, the connection and collaboration. So based on your knowledge and your observation, how could co-op play a role in the community to strengthen uh, the connection and the collaboration with different stakeholders? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome questions. Uh, to me, connection is, is really relationships. So developing strong relationships, meaningful relationships, taking the time, the understanding that Indigenous people, I think, all across Mother Earth are not transactional, that uh, with non-Indigenous, you know, business relationships, transactions, paper documents are, are very meaningful, but not, not so much to Indigenous people. So taking that time to get to know each other, you know, outside of the work world, starting your meetings with intention, with, with that local ceremony is if it's an elder that needs to you know pray or inviting youth to come in and drum and sing you know it, if it's having a land acknowledgement like we did today so building upon that and and not just doing it once but continuously so that the you feel that the stakeholders become friends allies you know in the beginning of, of the introduction you know more than just business partners and collaboration is opening it up for discussion oftentimes you know the organizations it's the low-level employees who know best how to move an organization forward you know what the gaps are um, what the problems are the challenges the barriers and the higher managers are the senior managers are, although maybe uh, a little bit aware, they're not because there's not that communication there. there. There's not that collaboration. So finding unique ways. And I think to me, all those four C's are connected. That if you're doing them all right, they're all going to increase as you go along. And that once you have a great relationship, the connection's happening, you got allyship, you got partnership going on, there's win-win. 
collaboration is naturally going to come because people are going, indigenous people are going to feel safe and trusted and that their seat at the table means something. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we might have time for one last interjection. Uh, anyone want to jump in to sharing or question? You know, I might ask one. I had a whole lot of questions ready, Tanya, and I just held them back because I'd like to hear other people talk. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw it on the table. So we're with the Center for the Co Center for Slave Cooperatives, and we tend to think, in theory, cooperatives should be a little different than other forms of organization. Uh, they have these democratic principles. The relationship between their owners is one of a usage relationship rather than an investor relationship. So you would expect different behavior or different ways of being. And I'm wondering if you've encountered that or if you're thinking about that when you work with the cooperators or whoever else, does that kind of come into your thinking at all or has it been foregrounded yet? Absolutely. Uh, one that um, I have a very small client list and the people that I work for with are very intentional. And I knew right away when I sat down with the idea team at the cooperators that their work culture was different, that they came from a sense of togetherness and teamwork. And it's been right from the beginning. And that's what, when I was first invited to do this, that I knew even that this was an extension of that. And because as an indigenous person, it's so hard to try to get an organization that's not there yet, you know, to a point where there, there's um, collaboration, connection, the four C's are there. And so um, I, I am honored to further the work, you know, with cooperators in this way because of that baseline value that's there with that, with that community connection. Well, with that, Tanya, thank you so much. Um, great gratitude for both uh, your, your wisdom today and your suggestion about the changing of our name to this event. Um, we will be doing something along those lines. We have to figure out a new title, but we'll, we'll come up with it. Um, great gratitude. Um, thank you, everyone. If everyone can put their virtual hands together uh, for Tanya, that would be wonderful. Um, and thank you for participating. Like I said earlier, we're going to share a recording of this event uh, and Tanya's kindly provide us with some kind of materials that you can consult, um, and that's coming up. I also want to just do a little plug for our next, uh, let's call it lunchtime conversation. Uh, it's going to be on October 5th. The first Wednesday of every month is when these events happen. And our speaker will be our very own, Stan Yu, Research and Communications Coordinator here at the Center. And he's going to be sharing some findings from a study that we did over the past year. And that is around two questions. One, do people who work in cooperatives shop at their own cooperative, right? Uh, and do they extend that loyalty out to other cooperatives? That's the second question. So stay tuned. We have some really neat um, findings from that work and uh, I think it's gonna be a really good talk. Thank you again, Tanya. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye now. Take care, everyone. <laughs>